Welcome to Thoughts on the Market. I'm Stephen Bird, Morgan Stanley's Global Head of Sustainability Research. And I'm Alan Gabriel, Head of Europe, Metals and Mining Research. I am Carlos de Alba, Head of the Americas Basic Materials Team. On this special episode of the podcast, we'll discuss the implications of decarbonization in the steel industry. It's Monday, April 24th at 10 a.m. in New York. And 3 p.m. in London. Achieving net zero is a top priority as the world moves into a new phase of climate urgency. And global decarbonization is one of the three big themes for 2023 for Morgan Stanley Research. Within this broader theme, we believe that decarbonizing steelmaking has the potential to trigger the biggest transformation of the steel industry in decades. Alain, to set the stage and just give our listeners a sense of the impact of steelmaking, just how much does steel contribute to global CO2 emissions? Thank you, Stephen. In fact, the steel industry emits around 3.6 billion tons of CO2 per annum. This enormous carbon footprint puts the industry at the heart of the climate debate, and public policy is rapidly evolving towards stricter emissions reductions targets, but also shorter implementation timelines. So, for instance, in Europe, which is leading this transformation by simultaneously introducing a carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is otherwise known as CBAM, and gradually reducing free CO2 allowances until their full removal by 2034. So, Alain, given the size of steel's contributions to emissions, it should come as no surprise that decarbonizing steel would likely really reconfigure the entire supply chain, including hydrogen, renewable energy, high-quality iron ore, and equipment providers. So, Alain, given this impending paradigm shift, what is the potential impact on upstream resources? Yes, the steel value chain is collectively exploring various ways to reduce carbon emissions, whether it was miners, steel makers, or even capital equipment providers. However, we think that the most promising path from today's perspective appears to be via the hydrogen direct reduced iron electric arc furnaces process, which is also known as H2DRI EAF in short. Admittedly, if we were to have this conversation again in three years, this conclusion might be different. But back to the H2DRI EAF process, It promises to curb emissions by 99% by replacing carbon from coal with hydrogen to release the oxygen molecules from iron ore and convert it to pure iron. The catch is that this process is resource intensive and will face significant supply constraints and bottlenecks, which in a way is positive for upstream pricing. So if we were to hypothetically convert the entire industry in Europe today, we will need more than 55% of Europe's entire production of green hydrogen last year and we'll also need more than double the global production of DR-grade pellets, which is a niche high-grade iron ore product. Alain, you believe that steel economics in Europe is really at an inflection point right now. And uh, given that Europe will likely see the biggest disruption when it comes to the green steel transformation, I wondered if you could give us a snapshot of the current situation in Europe and of your outlook there. Should steel mills choose to adopt the H2DRI EAF process? they would need to build out an entire infrastructure associated with it. And we detail each component of that chain in our note. But in aggregate, we estimate that the average capital intensity will be approximately $1,200 per ton. And this excludes the buildup of renewable electricity. So on OPEX, green hydrogen and renewable electricity will constitute more than 50% of production costs. And this will lead to wide disparities between regions. So the economics of this transformation will only work in our view, under effective policy support to level the playing field, and this would include a combination of grants, subsidies, and carbon border taxes. Fortunately, the EU policy is moving in that direction, but is lagging the United States. So Carlos, as we heard from Alain, Europe is leading this green steel transformation, but at the same time, the US has the greenest steel footprint and is benefiting from some relative advantages vis-a-vis Europe and the rest of the world. Could you walk us through these advantages and the competitive gap between the US and other regions? Yeah, I mean, definitely the US is already very well positioned. And what drives this position of strength is the fact that about 70% of the steel production in the US is made out of electric car furnace. And that emits roughly around half a ton of CO2 per ton of steel, which is significantly better than the average of 1.7 tons per ton of steel and the blast furnace route average of around two tons per ton of steel. So that is really the genesis of the better position that the U.S. has in terms of emissions. Another way of looking at it is the U.S., produces around 6% of the global crude steel, and it only emits around 2% of the overall steel emissions in the world. 
That's a good way of laying it out, Carlos. It's interesting in the U.S., the cost of electricity being relatively low certainly does help with the cost of making steel as well. I wanted to shift over to China and India, which are responsible for two-thirds of global steel emissions. How are they positioned for this green steel transition? Yeah, I mean, these two countries are significant contributors to the emissions in the world. When you take the average emission per ton of steel produced in India, it's around 2.4 tons. And in China, it's around 1.8 tons. And the reason being is that they have a disproportional majority of their steel made under the blast furnace route that, as I alluded to previously, emits more CO2 per ton of steel than other routes like the electric car furnaces. So it's going to take some time, definitely, for them to reposition their massive steel industry, steel capacity, and reduce their emissions. We need to keep in mind that these two countries in particular have to weight not only the emissions that their steel sector provides, but also the economic implications of such an important sector. They contribute to jobs, they contribute to economic activity, they provide the raw material for their infrastructure and the development of their cities and their urbanization trends. So for them, it's not necessarily just straightforward a matter of reducing their emissions, but they need to weight it and make sure that they have a balance between economic growth, urbanization, infrastructure, build up, and obviously the environment. So Stephen, given that the scale of the global city industry, what are some of the broader sustainability implications of the shift towards green steel production? How do you view this transition through the lens of your environmental, social, and governance or ESG framework? Yeah, Carlos says Zolan started the scope of emissions from the steel industry certainly is worthy of attention. We think a lot about the supply chain required to provide the clean energy and electrolyzers necessary to achieve this transformation that you both have laid out. Now, green hydrogen supply in particular is limited and will take some time to ramp up. So while technically feasible, there are numerous hurdles to overcome to make widespread green hydrogen use a reality. We do expect the ramp up to be gradual. A lot of capital is being deployed, but this will take time. Now on clean energy, I think it's a bit more straightforward. The cost of clean energy has been dropping for years, just as a frame of reference. In the United States from 2010 to 2020, the cost of clean energy dropped annually by about 15% per year, which is quite remarkable. Now the levelized cost of electricity from renewables is lower in the US and China relative to Europe. So we think a lot about the growth in clean energy, We do think that the capital will be there. The cost of clean energy, we believe, will continue to drop. So that is a hopeful development that over time should result in a lower and lower cost for green steel. Alain, Carlos, thanks for taking the time to talk. Great speaking with you both. Yeah, thank you very much. I enjoy your discussions as well. And thanks for listening. If you enjoy Thoughts on the Market, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and share the podcast with a friend or colleague today. The preceding content is informational only and based on information available when created. It is not an offer or solicitation, nor is it tax or legal advice. It does not consider your financial circumstances and objectives and may not be suitable for you.